Hello, everybody. Welcome. This is the first episode I've ever done where I'm recording this as video and audio, and I'm here with Kate Richardson. Hey, how's hello, it going, everybody? welcome. Thanks. I'm <laughs> glad to be here. Thanks for joining me. Um, uh, Kate, let's kind of jump into it. Tell me a little bit about a, a quick bio about yourself. Sure. So I'm a registered dietitian nutritionist here in Orlando, Florida. I'm licensed in the state of Florida, and I co-own a private practice called Nutrition Awareness, where we see people one-on-one. -on -one. I got my degree from Missouri State University, born and raised in Missouri, and then moved to Florida for my first clinical job right out of school. Did I tell you I lived in St. Louis for four years? Yes, which really okay. excites me. I know that you had told me it wasn't your favorite place on planet Earth, and I totally get it. <laughs> All right. We'll talk about that later on. All right. Real quick, five questions here in about three minutes. What is your job title and what do you do with, with clients, patients? I am a registered dietitian nutritionist. It's often seen as RDN. I am also a licensed dietitian here in Florida. And I specialize in private practice, so I help people reach their ultimate health goals using a personalized nutrition approach. And what are the usual steps to achieve your professional degree? There are a lot of steps, Richard, and I think this is the biggest misconception. <laughs> you have to get an undergraduate degree in nutrition and dietetics. Then you have to apply to a 1,200-hour supervised practice program. It's extremely competitive. Only about 50% of students get matched. Really? Once you complete, uh -huh. And once you complete that program, now you have to complete a master's program, which you can do sometimes with that supervised practice. It depends on your program. And then from there, you have to take a credentialing exam. So there are quite a few steps. And then you're free. <laughs> <laughs> you're free. It's, it's you're let free. you go. Um, what's the best part of your profession? Making connections with people and helping them think about food in ways that they've never thought about it before. And misconceptions people have about your profession. That I'm just going to tell them what to eat and what not to eat and that it's that simple. Because it's right. not. <laughs> We're going to get into that a little bit later. And... Finally, what other professions do you usually work with? When I worked in a hospital, an endless amount of different professions. I would say now that I'm in private practice, I work with a lot of concierge medicine. Mm -hmm. I work with a lot of personal trainers or people who are in the fitness industry, uh, people who are doing a lot of personalized wellness services. Got it. All right. Well, that's a nice quick um, uh, summary or at least introduction of your profession. I just want to let people know that so thanks for doing that Kate um, just diving in you know about your profession tell me what the difference is you between RDN and an L I'm sorry LRDN registered dietitian and nutritionist yes and an LD a licensed yes. dietitian so licensed dietitian just confirms that I have been keeping up with my licensure requirements so to be a registered dietitian nutritionist, you have to go through all of those steps that I mentioned earlier, going right. through school, doing your credentials, making sure you get that 1200 supervised practice program done. And then from there, you have to do continuing education units every five years to maintain that credential of a registered dietitian nutritionist. Being licensed, oh. you have to follow certain protocols depending on the state in which you live. So there are specific things related to medical nutrition therapy right. that I can speak about in Florida because I keep up with my licensure and I follow Florida's protocols that I couldn't speak to someone about in Wyoming or a state where I'm not licensed. And that depends on the state and it depends on the specific topic. I can give general nutrition advice to anybody, no matter where they live. I've had clients who live in other countries, other states, but if it's really specific to a medical condition, then I have to be more careful and make sure that I only accept clients who fit uh, my scope. Does every RDN um, need an LD um, to, to provide that advice or it depends on the state you're in? It depends on the state. As far as I know, the, there are only two states that do not require the LD, one of them being oh. California and off the top of my head, I can't think of the other one. Okay. So LD, if you want to practice in all 50 states, well, actually all 48 states, you need an LD for each of those states. It's going to depend on that specialty. 
So okay. yes and no. I can work with people, let's say weight loss. I could work with someone who doesn't have really specific nutrition needs related to a medical condition right. anywhere. But if I had somebody in, let's say, Texas reach out to me um, and they had kidney disease, they have really specific nutrition requirements for kidney disease. Okay. And I wouldn't risk my licensure to work with that. I would, I would rather point that person to a registered licensed dietitian in their state. Got it. So since we're on this topic, how do you differentiate, differentiate what you're doing from what people um, to the other title of a nutritionist? Um, I know we've talked about this before, but if you could kind of lay that out a little bit more in, in cl for clarity here. In a, in a short sentence, anybody could be a nutritionist. You're anybody? Yeah, anybody can call themselves a nutritionist, right? You can call yourself a nutritionist. You just are interested in nutrition, uh, but you don't have any governed credentials. Mm. You'll often find people who call themselves nutritionists who probably are very well-meaning. They might have a lot of good information. They might have some good experiences. And maybe they found out about being a nutritionist or getting into nutrition later in their life. And they want to just spread the word and they find something online that gives them a certification. Maybe it's a 20 hour nutrition course under hmm. some business that decided to sell nutrition courses to make money. And then they say that they're a certified nutritionist, but that certification could literally come from anywhere. So that being said, you'll see a lot of things popping up now in the industry where people are very niched down. They right. might be a ketogenic nutritionist, meaning they are nutritionist that specialize in the ketogenic diet or a low carb nutritionist or a hormone balancing nutritionist or a holistic nutritionist. If you're seeking out a nutritionist, you have to be extremely careful about who you're working with and making sure that they have a very, um, a good background that shows that they know their stuff and they're not just pulling information out of thin air. I see. So obviously a nutritionist does, there's a lot of different, Anybody can be a nutritionist. The higher um, training is with the dietitian, and to make sure that they are, are are legit in that state and can practice. And what um, I've read is can um, provide um, how should I say medical nutrition medical therapy. nutrition therapy or prescribed nutrition therapy. That's yeah. where you need your license. You got it. And Got just to it. add to that too, when you are working with a registered dietitian, we are held to extremely high standards, not only in just how we practice, meaning we can, we, we hold ourselves to a standard of providing people with evidence-based nutrition, not just things that we think might be true, that we want to be true, that maybe we've seen a few times happen. We give people really solid advice that's based in science and evidence and research. A nutritionist is not held to that standards. Uh, an individual might choose to practice that way depending yep. on who they are and what their viewpoint is, right. but they are not being governed by a body that ensures that they do that. We also have a code of ethics. So our governing body that renews our licensure, that gives us our certification, makes sure that we are following a code of ethics. And so an example of this could be accepting a sponsorship. A nutritionist might have a very popular following on a social media platform right. yeah. and they might get offered a lot of money to post about a supplement, but they have no governing body holding them accountable to doing their research on this supplement. And they could just be giving you random information, making outlandish claims to make money on the supplement. So it's within our profession to really be picky about the types of companies that we work with mm -hmm. because we have an ethical obligation to the people that we serve. Right. Well, that was very clear. I, thank you very much because you see there's a lot of people that claim to be nutritionists. And I'm like, how does that, how do you separate that from being a dietitian and, and these other, other degrees that we were talking about? All right. Um, what, uh, what type of patients do you take care of in your practice? Well, I should tell you, that my practice, uh, we do have a bit of a, a niche, meaning we have a target population that we work best with. Hmm. We see a lot of lifestyle clients, meaning people who are looking to improve the quality of their life using nutrition, whether this is just getting more energy or changing their weight, changing their meal patterns to fit a specific job, or maybe they have 
physical performance goals. Maybe they mm -hmm. do a lot of athletic training. Maybe they want to run a marathon. Maybe they do CrossFit and they really want to optimize their nutrition. I would say that's about 80%. Now, within that 80% of clients that we see, we will have some people with specific medical nutrition therapy needs. So you might have somebody who is doing CrossFit, wants right. to put on lean muscle mass, have energy and improve their strength, but they also have really high cholesterol and they're pre-diabetic. So our personalization approach is going to make sure that not only are they getting to where they want to be from an athletic standpoint and a performance point of view, but also that they're optimizing their diet to help get those numbers within healthy ranges. And that is something that we take really seriously because if I have somebody coming in with really high cholesterol and I'm giving them recommendations that aren't conducive to a heart healthy diet, mm -hmm. then I could be doing more harm than good regardless of their physical performance pursuits. I presume you work in coordination with some of their doctors as well? Yes. Mm -hmm. So we'll have our clients sign a release form and they will uh, give us permission to speak to their physicians, their others. I think a lot of our clients, because we are a private practice, they work with a lot of concierge medicine. Mm. So they have doctors that they have really close relationships with, which is wonderful because they're more available to speak to us, I find. Uh, but then we also talk to their trainers. We talk to their endocrinologists, their specialists. Oftentimes, they'll just bring in their own lab work and we can help them work through it. Got it. Well, geez, that's great that you guys are able to coordinate that with your clients. Um, what's your typical day like? Oh, man, Kate? my days are different every day. So the difference between me and a lot of other dietitians is that me and my business partner, we're two dietitians that work together. Mm -hmm. We are in private practice. We are the minority of where dietitians end up working. Most dietitians are going to go into a very clinical position, and that's where I started, and I thought it was an incredible experience where you work in a hospital as a dietitian, either in an intensive care unit or on a step-down unit, and you work with acute care patients. Uh, many dietitians also go into acute care or long-term care facilities right. where there might be an older population, geriatric. Many go into a culinary route where there are dietitians for specific Companies like Taco Bell has a registered dietitian, for instance, or they might be going into food service, which would be something like a school who needs a registered dietitian to make sure that the food that they're offering their students is in line with certain guidelines, fitting the budget. A lot of all options. Those, a lot of options. That's the cool thing about being a dietitian. You can, where there's food and where there's people, you can make a job, <laughs> where there's right? food. <laughs> where there's food and people, which we would say are most places. I mean, there's, you might have seen in certain grocery stores, there's dietitians. I thought that was something up my alley for a while. But my job is different now because not only am I a dietitian and yeah. I'm providing dietary services and consultations and coaching to people, but I also co, I am a partner at a business. So we have to do a lot of our own marketing. We have mm -hmm. to get out there and we have to let people know that we are an option and that they don't have to turn to bogus medical weight loss spas or things that really restrict people from eating a whole healthy diet. We are a different option for them. So we have to do a lot of our own marketing. So to answer your question, my average day is not going to be a nine to five. Every other day is different depending on when I'm seeing clients, how booked my calendar is that day. I might have one client that day. Mm -hmm. I might have six. And then, of course, my follow-up work with them. I always make sure my documentation is clear. I'm answering emails because they hired me to give them a service. Yep. So I need to be available for them when I say I'm going to be available. And then a lot of marketing. We do a lot of presentations, a lot of speaking. And then we have a podcast, and so a lot of our time is spent doing media work to either record our podcast, market our podcast, share the podcast, get on social media. I mean, we are a one-man band, to say the least. Mm -hmm. So my days are divided, split up differently, and I wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> when you're seeing these clients, what do you um, – can you tell me a little bit about some of the clients that you – a client or two that – how you've helped them and – and what progress you saw or challenges. Ooh. Yes. I know there's a lot of options, but you know, what, get a taste of what B is like when you're actually one on one with a client. It's emotional. So, my job, I would not say, is for somebody who doesn't like tears, who <laughs> is uncomfortable. Really? 
Oh yeah, I have a box of tissues on our desk because people cry. <laughs> It's, really? it's crazy. So uh, you asked me about a specific client story. Okay. Yeah. I see. <clears throat> I get this a lot. Um, when people book their appointment on our website, we ask them, what's your goal for this appointment? Yeah. And I'll read something pretty generic. Sometimes people pour their heart out right there. And at least then I have a little bit of a warning like, okay, this is going to be a deep one. This is going to be a lot. Uh, but sometimes it'd just be one sentence like lose 10 pounds, improve energy and feel healthy. Okay. Very generalized. So very general. So the first thing I ask anybody when they sit down is, you know, I read your goals for today's appointment, but expand on that for me. Like what made you decide this is it? I'm going to invest the time, the money and energy to work with a dietitian. You, you've had to hit some kind of breaking point to be here right now. Mm. And sometimes that question releases the floodgates, Richard. People tell me something that really personal, personally happened to them. They mm. might be having an experience with an interpersonal relationship. They might be feeling so badly about themselves. They might be struggling for years and years of yo-yo dieting and they gain weight and lose weight and gain weight and lose weight and they don't even know how to eat without following some kind of basic meal plan that makes yeah. them feel like they're missing out on life. And they feel horrible about themselves. They feel like a failure. They look back at pictures of them in high school and they're like, how was I so thin then or so happy then? And a lot of what we talk about is not only just changing their diet, but changing how they live their life and how they see food and not relying on some kind of cookie cutter fad diet to tell them how to eat. And some people don't want to hear that. Some yeah. people just want me to tell them how to eat. And I found that when I do that, I don't really help them. They need to learn how to eat and then they need to learn to execute on those goals and those practices but also do a lot of inner reflection to know what's really truly best with them. So I'm often just hmm. facilitating a lifestyle change rather than just writing a prescription of how to eat for people. It gets emotional. Interesting how people have a very unique connection to food oh, and yeah. how it affects them. Well, it's fun. It's fun for me because I'm, I'm a sick freak and I get pleasure out of this. But asking people, <laughs> you know, you know, when you were a kid, what, how did your parents or your guardians speak about food? How did they speak about their body? How did they speak about your eating habits? Yeah. And I'll tell you a story. This one sticks out to me, but I hear these things all the time. I had a woman come in in her 60s. When you look at her, she's a healthy size. Uh, she doesn't stick at, she doesn't look like someone who's got a problem with food, which yeah. is the case quite often, believe it or not. Mm. And she would share with me, she had this very supportive husband. It was just them two. And he never made comments about her food or her body. He never made her feel shame. But when she was a kid, she was adopted. And her mother was naturally very thin-bodied, but very conscious about food, constantly talking about food in the house. And whenever this specific client of mine would eat something that did not fit the idea of her mother's yeah. picture of health, she would make comments. And one thing she would do is she would sniff my client's breath to see if she was sneaking peanut butter. So, yeah. What? So as a 60-year-old woman, she was still doing this. Her husband would leave Decades the house. Decades later. Decades later. He would leave the house, and she all of a sudden just gave herself permission to eat everything and anything that she wanted. She would go eat a bunch of peanut butter. She'd eat candy. She loved gelato. Mm. She'd be eating gelato at 10 a.m. because, oh, my husband left for work. Now it's safe and okay. I won't be judged. Even though she consciously knew in the front of her brain... Her husband wouldn't judge her. Yeah, he, he didn't, didn't care. Even, he had no complexes with food. He had a neutral relationship with food. Hers was traumatic and tumultuous, and it stemmed mm. from her mother always being on her rear about it. And so one of the things we worked on was allowing herself to eat food in front of her husband, in front of other people, without shaming herself for it. So it's not just which food to choose, but actually knowing when to do it, mm -hmm. and sometimes who to do it in front of. Exactly. Huh. And, and what your fears are that are actually triggering unwanted eating behaviors. Everyone knows you sh eating gelato at 10 a.m. every day is not conducive to a, most people's idea of a healthy lifestyle unless yeah. you're just living it up in Italy or something. <laughs> we know this consciously. Or a lot of people who are trying to change their health consciously know, oh, I yeah. need to do more of this, less of that. Yeah. But part of my job is helping them break down the barriers of why won't you do it and how can we get you to do the things you know you need to do without completely throwing you for a loop? Got it. 
Um, how would you describe your work-life balance? As I prioritize. I prioritize work-life balance. But here's what I will say. When I worked in the hospital, my work-life balance was effortless. You clock in, you mm. clock out, you don't think about work. I had to work one weekend a month, but I got weekend or weekdays off that week. Yeah. And it was like work-life balance was not a problem. I never thought about it. Yeah. When you are in private practice and you pay your own bills, you don't get a paycheck, you pay your own health insurance, you do everything on your own, I like to think of it as work-life integration. <laughs> so I know how to read myself. And if I'm feeling burnt out, maybe all I do that day is see clients and I spend the rest of the day doing things I need to do just to relax. But then there are days where I'm just, and this is more often than not, where I'm just jazzed and I'm, I'm ready to kill it. Yeah. So I, I'm up early doing my job. I'm working a lot. I don't get tired. I take breaks when I need to. I don't forget to eat. I don't forget to drink water. But I can work late into the night just doing things marketing-wise or responding to correspondences, uh, doing a lot of social media work, writing podcasts, creating content for my clients, mm -hmm. uh, handouts, because I want to. So I would say that my work-life integration is exactly where I want it to be right now, and there's lots of flexibility, but I choose to do that. I know that there's a lot of people who own businesses that struggle with this because they tell me about it, Yeah, and it's a choice. I love that. A nice word to kind of uh, describe what you're doing, integration. I love mm -hmm. that. Um, uh, what percentage of, of dietitians do you think are in private practice like you are versus the other avenues? It's growing. I think it's growing. I don't know if I could tell you a percentage, but if I look at all the dietitians I know and I look about the, at the industry and the profession, I would say single digits. No way it's more than 10% because it's hard. Got it. Um, shifting gears a little bit, a little bit about your professional outlook. Okay. What do you think the future of your profession, not your career necessarily, but the profession itself, looks like as a dietitian what i think it looks like will be will, think, will look like in the future i think is it's going it to be ex pretty extremely pretty... specialized oh. i think are you i don't know you have to tell me if you see this in your profession in your realm but people are looking for specialists in a lot of areas of health instead of one man bands people that do everything jack of all trades is the the expression i'm yes. trying to think of I think that dietitians need to niche down and become specialists as they go through their education. I'm hoping to see it become more diversified. It's mostly white women. It seems to be diversifying more, but I, I, that's the trend right now. So that's what I'm hoping will happen. I see the profession gaining more competition with the trend we're seeing in business with the coaching industry. Uh -huh. You see a lot of people being health coaches and life coaches and money coaches. And anybody with a credential or a degree in anything is going to get a little offended and competitive when they see people who just decide that, hey, you know what? Like, I know how to eat healthy and I lost weight, so now I can charge other yeah. people for information. So I see us having to pivot to meet the needs of the, or the understanding of the consumers to compete with people who, in our, our perspective, cannot offer the same type of evidence-based qualified nutrition. So I see a lot of us going to virtual, to specialization, and hopefully diversifying. Well, I would agree. There's a, uh, there's a growing aspect of being a specialist. Um, in many aspects of medicine, even several of my guests themselves have said that um, you know, being a specialist has been helpful or, or maybe even pr provide them a little bit more security and or even just, you know, uh, more intellectual curiosity, you know. Um, not like you can't make it as a generalist, but definitely more people as the population is growing, as, our, um, as the science grows, I think being a specialist definitely um, is, is something that a lot of people could find as a, a allow them to get a niche. Yes. And if I could, if I could add to that, Richard, yeah. too, if in, in my profession, and this is like a sad, this is a very sad truth. If you are, if you are interested in finances, 
when you first get out of the gate as a dietitian, there are salary caps. It is not easy to make a lot of money as a clinical dietitian, even if you specialize in a clinic. If you want to make a lot of money as a dietitian, you have to be able to offer something un incredible that people will pay money for, that people will say, this keeps me up at night, I need this problem solved. And if you're just a general dietitian who isn't niche down, you're more of a dime a dozen and people aren't going to be as invested. And the beautiful thing about being a niche dietitian who has a practice, who can offer an incredible personalized service is that you will get people who will actually take your recommendations and do what needs to be done. I don't know who mm -hmm. coined the phrase, but I heard it from a guy named Dean Graziazzi. And he said, people who pay money, pay attention. And one of my biggest personal frustrations in a hospital setting was sitting with somebody, I was a cardiac pulmonary dietitian, sitting with somebody who had just gotten open heart surgery. They're like barely hanging on. I'm in there from their doctor's orders, trying to open up a conversation about diet changes for healthy hearts, right? Yeah. And they either wanted nothing to do with me or they politely took my information and I knew they weren't gonna do anything about it. Or maybe they genuinely cared, but I'd never get to follow up with them again once they were discharged from the hospital. So who knows mm. what happened? Nobody was there holding them accountable. When someone sees a niche that you can solve a problem that only they think that you can only solve and you charge money for it, they will pay and then they will show up and they will they will change their life and your job will be more satisfying. Yeah, I totally agree. Totally agree. Uh, Kate, what type of students do you think best flourish in this profession? Dietitians are very split. So in my experience in college, I was a black sheep. The dietitian profession is notorious for being type A. People mm. who are extremely do it by the book, textbook, organized, maybe a little anal, if I could say. Are you in talking about way. me? No, I'm not talking about you. Well, Emma, <laughs> I don't know. You know you. But that was the, that's the uh, respect because I would watch these girls. I was like, how do they always have their ducks in a row? It, yeah. it always made me feel self conscious. And those type of girls, I find are so successful in their clinical jobs. They mm -hmm. are the best in intensive care units because you have to be, you have to be detail oriented when somebody is hooked up to TPN and that, which stands for parental nutrition, total it's, parental uh, nutrition. You got yeah. it. So getting yeah. nutrients in your blood through an IV, you got to be pretty meticulous if you don't want to, I don't know, kill someone or shoot their blood sugars up through the roof or mm -hmm. whatever. Therefore, they do very, very well. And I would say that's probably 75, 80% of, of what dietitians do. I would say for my specific job, you have to be somebody who loves people. You have to be somebody who cares about people. Mm -hmm. But you also have to be, you have to have a high emotional intelligence is what I would say, the EQ because people will share their feelings to you and they will spill out their guts and they'll mm. tell you their problems or maybe they don't know exactly how to phrase their problem. But if they sit there and tell you, I want this, I need this, this is what I struggle with. And you get so caught up in the textbook way of doing things and you're just like, okay, um, eat 30 grams of protein and you, you can't meet them halfway. Yeah. You're just giving them facts. Then they're going to leave there feeling misheard. They're not going to feel understood and they're not going to, change they're not going to get to their goal so you have to be someone who's emotionally intelligent you have to love people you have to have some flexibility and understand that not everyone geeks out on nutrition the same way you do and <laughs> you have to be able to break things down in layman's terms for the average person yep. to be able to understand and actually use making those connections with people having um being on the same wavelength this is very important or at least sympathizing empathizing with them totally agree and this is from an anesthesiologist, by the way. Yeah, yeah, you have to. Um, I agree. All right, so again, let's change it a little bit about, about you. Were you someone, you said you weren't a type A student. Nope. So what kind of student were you when you were in high school and, and college? In high school and college, I was a B student, I'll be honest. I got by, I had A's in a few classes, yeah. C's in some classes but I showed up and 
did my best, but I had a mix of priorities. The reason that I believe I got accepted into an internship program was because I was extremely diversified in my experiences. I had excellent work experience as a dietitian student. I had great connections with my professors. I was doing lots of social and volunteer opportunities outside of school. So from what I believe happened when the professors at dietitian residencies and supervised practice, we yeah. call it the, we call this by the way, the supervised practice is an internship. So we call it both things. Um, when they were looking through my resume and they saw that I had like a, I think I had a 3.25 GPA, nothing to write home about. That's not competitive for the dietitian degree. But then they saw, oh, maybe she got these grades because she was doing so many other things that I fit a certain program's idea of what they wanted in a program or in a student. Mm -hmm. So my program was looking for people who were definitely more into the social community aspect and bringing nutrition to the community rather than just strict clinical. Uh, if you were trying to go into a clinical internship or supervised practice where you really wanted to work in the hospital and only the hospital, you would need at least a 3.8 or more GPA. Wow, wow. So that was, so I was a type B social student. But were you thinking about being a dietitian even as, in a high, as, high, as a high school student? Yeah, I knew I wanted to be a dietitian in seventh grade. Why? I, my group in the house, so a little bit about me, uh, my mom and dad never made comments to me about my eating. I was only a child. Uh, nobody ever made me feel bad about my food. I never felt judged by my family with how I ate, but I watched yeah. my family judge themselves, specifically the women in my family, make comments about their own body, about their own eating. I watched my mom, who was an angel, always going on diets. We had diet food in the house. She was making comments about her body. She had always struggled with her own mm. nutrition and weight. And I just absorbed it like a little sponge. And I became obsessed with eating and nutrition. I full fledged can admit that I had disordered eating thoughts my entire adolescence. It was an obsession. And it started off as a negative thing. But as I went through high school and college, I went into college to Claire as a dietitian. My relationship with nutrition and diet evolved as I grew up. Sure. And then I thought, okay, I want to be a sports dietitian because mm. I was really into fitness and sports. And then I realized that's actually kind of boring, <laughs> kind of boring to me. Uh, so then I realized what I really like to do is just talk to people about food and help them optimize their life. And I knew that I was going to be in private practice and I knew it was going to happen for me. So it's just kind of funny that I I'd started off from – uh, having an eating disorder, mm. which I think a lot of dietitians also could admit, mm. um, especially if you think about type A personalities, they're more likely to suffer from di uh, eating disorders or disordered eating practices. And that's kind of where the interest sparks. But you grow out of it, you grow out of it or you get help. And in my so case, you, that's what because of your, your personal experiences as a young child, that affected your career choice. Were there other careers that you were thinking about outside of being a dietitian? A journalist. I thought about being a journalist. Hmm. Didn't want to do reporting. I saw that that's, it's not a very creative outlet. I thought it was creative and it's not. I thought I maybe would want to be an occupational therapist. And I think the only reason I dabbled with that is because when I learned about the salaries of an average dietitian, that disheartened me because an occupational therapist made a lot more money. Mm -hmm. But then I realized that that career is just not the best fit for my personality. And I love food. I love nutrition. And I really could not think of myself doing anything else. I could talk about food, nutrition, till the cows come home. Well, we, we only have so much time on this video here, this audio, this audio cast. So, <laughs> well, uh, well, well, we have to unfortunately stop it at some point. Yeah. Um, um, so, is there any advice you could give students who are thinking about being a dietitian? Some advice they're like, mm, I'm not sure if I want to do this, or maybe I do want to do this, but I link to find out more information. What what do you kind of advice could you give a student that wants to learn more? My advice to someone who wants to go into nutrition. There's a few things that pop in my mind right away. I'll share two. The first one is know your why. If you're just going into the field of dietetics because you like to follow diet plans or you just have like an interest in nutrition, 
remember this is your job and your job is to change people's lives using nutrition not just mm. talk at them yeah. so if you're looking for a job where you just talk to people about facts without actually trying to help them and change their life please don't be a dietitian because you're not going to help anyone and you're going to confuse people and you're going to break down the integrity of being a dietitian and i'll just say that i would also say Get crystal clear on what kind of field that you want to work in by getting real experience. Talk mm -hmm. to dietitians in different perspectives and pay attention to their attitudes. If you're talking to someone who's got a bad attitude about their job, it's yeah. not because of the profession. It's just of who they are. So yeah. get a diverse perspective or get diverse perspectives from people in every single field of dietitian that piques your interest, whether it's clinical, whether it's a community dietitian, somebody in a hospital or a grocery store or a sports dietitian really ask if you can sit with them and talk to them or even shadow great advice uh i think some of those two principles can be applied to a lot of professions a lot of careers mm -hmm. kind of gain experience talking to different people for sure and i think that's great if you're getting a, a lousy experience with somebody and they're just a they're just not mentally in it find somebody that is so you at least you understand someone that really enjoys their career yeah. and then see if it matches you, you know? Yeah. You don't um, want to talk to someone who's jaded. Agreed. Agreed. Um, I want to change the topic now to something a little more lighthearted. What I'd like to call my rapid fire questions. All right. You ready? ready. <laughs> really hard here. Um, what's your favorite ice cream flavor? Cookie dough. Cookie dough. All right. What's your favorite vegetable? Oh, Brussels sprouts. Only if they are roasted with Parmesan. I just saw a video on how to make Brussels sprout chips. Oh, yeah, that sounds delicious. <laughs> um, what's something you could eat straight for a week? Oh, there's so many things I could eat. Cheese from the bag, shredded cheese. For a week. For a week? Oh, wait, would that be my only food? Yeah, uh, yes. Oh, okay. Well, then let me retract that answer. If I could only eat one food every day for a week. For a week. That's so hard because I start going into the nutrient content. I'm like, salmon, no, wait, there's too much mercury. Eggs, well, you know, I would say almond butter. Almond butter. It's a, It's got a lot of different nutrients. That's a cerebral de decision, isn't that, for you? It's a yeah, very, this is very hard for me. All right, let's get off the nutrition questions. What kind of book do you like to read? Personal growth and business. What kinds of musical instruments have you learned to play? cello barely in fifth grade and it was my orchestra teacher's worst nightmare <laughs> thank goodness we're not doing that anymore mm -hmm. um was there a chore you really hated doing as a child uh still do uh, i had to clean out the cat litter box and mm -hmm. i will not get a cat Sounds like fun. Reason. <laughs> would you rather burp every time you lean in for a kiss or drool every time you talk Drool. Interesting. Yeah. I just wear a mask. I can just wear a mask now. It's acceptable. Um, what comes easy for you or easily for you that is more difficult for other people? Listening. If you, um, if I was starting art um, in your business, what is the most important advice, uh, piece of advice you'd give me? Don't give up. It's hard. The highs are high and the lows are low. Love that. Love that. And finally, if you could have dinner with anyone from history, who would it be? I hate this question, Richard, and I've been known to talk about how much I hate it. <laughs> could be anybody. I would say I would have dinner with, okay, this is a weird answer. It comes to my mind every Even day. better. Even better. Let's hear it. Hitler. Because I want to know. I that wanna is know. definitely not what I was thinking. I know. I just, I, <laughs> and hear me out. It's not that I want to know. All right, here's I want to know who he, I would love to just like watch him and mm. be like, who are you? Like, what is your actual, I want to get to know him and be like, what made you such an evil person? What initiated that and what continued that, those actions? Yeah, just that I'm is curious. Deep. That is curious. And you'd be a good listener for that too. I would just sit there and ask him questions. Well, you'd have to learn German though. Well, <laughs> I take it back. I'm not doing that. <laughs> All right. 
So where can listeners go to reach you and learn more about you, Kate? We could go, I think you go a few places. I would yep. say if you're really interested in nutrition information, just out of curiosity, we have a podcast, the Nutrition Awareness Podcast, me and my partner. Mm -hmm. If you are interested in learning more about how to be a dietitian, you could send us a direct message on Instagram. We are at nutrition.awareness. And we also have a website, nutritionawareness.com. Got it. And what is your partner's name? Megan. Megan. Poke a check. Don't even try to spell it. If you look up <laughs> Megan Ware, it's her maiden name. I, I can barely spell her last name. It's like Polish now, but that she just got married like a year and a half ago. And awesome. Maybe two years awesome. ago. Well, listen, it is great and has been great that, uh, to get to talk to you. So glad we connected. Thank yeah, you so me much. Too. I'm so glad you found us. This has been a lot of fun. All right.